speaker, switching to fibroblasts, is Dan Champelin from the um, Mayor in Rochester, um, who's going to be talking to us today about mechano regulation of matrix deposition and fibrosis progression. He's going to tell us exactly how the fibroblasts interact with the macrophages, right? No. no. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Zia, for the introduction, and uh, thank you to the organizers of the meeting and everybody at the PFF who helped put this meeting together. It's my first time at the meeting, and it's been incredibly educational and inspirational, and actually wish I brought more people from my lab here, because I think they would have learned an immense amount from all the experts who presented here. So, um, so today I'm going to tell, I'm going to shift gears and tell you a little bit about um, a, a different signal that we think is important in the propagation and progression of pulmonary fibrosis, and that's really sort of mechanical signaling from the matrix to the cells and from the cells back to the matrix. And so this is a, a, a schematic that's a, a decade a decade old now that sort of uh, captures a lot of the um, essential elements that we think distinguish normal injury and wound healing responses. Um, and I think the puzzle we're trying to solve, all of us really, is what's the divergence point here between a normal resolution and repair and wound healing response, and how do you diverge off of this path onto a, a propagating fibrotic response? And so I think fibroblasts are an essential part of normal wound healing. Uh, I think they become activated of myofibroblasts as part of that canonical wound healing response, but we really see persistent activation of those cells in a fibrotic remodeling lung, and we see that excessive deposition by those cells of extracellular matrix that's an essential part of fibrosis. And so I think the idea we've had is that there's some positive feedback loop here, that as the matrix gets deposited, it probably changes the mechanical environment in the lung. What I'm going to try and convince you is that the cells actually sense that, and the cells are very responsive to that and actually get better and better at making matrix, and this has the potential to then explain this propagating aspect of the disease. So we set out on this, on this course about 10 years ago. Um, we developed a technique to section lung tissue uh, that was um, uh, displayed on a microscope stage. And you can see here some images of the alveolar architecture. And then we developed a AFM technique, basically a micro-indentation technique, where we could poke the tissue and ascertain how stiff the tissue is. And you can make maps of, of uh, sort of sham-treated lung tissue. These are from mice. Or you can take the bleomycin model, and you can show that areas of the lung, as you would expect with fibrosis and scarring, are getting stiffer over time. And we've replicated that in, in human IPF lung tissue as well. So this is no surprise to anybody, but it does give us a a sense of the magnitude, you're seeing a six to tenfold change in the mechanical properties of the extracellular matrix in a mature scar in the fibrotic lung. And so it gives us a starting point for thinking about how should we model this in an in vitro system. So this is an in vitro system that we don't use a lot. It's a, it's a, it's a movie that hopefully we'll play. And the idea was here was to take cells and put them in a very in, uh, uh, artificial environment of a very soft matrix. So you can see these are actually fibroblasts that are all rounded up. They don't look like you would expect them to look in a 2D tissue culture dish. But this dish is coated with a transparent, thin polyacrylamide gel that has a second cross-linking system built into it. And so as I play the movie, we will change the stiffness from very soft to something as stiff as the fibrotic lung. And so you, you'll see nothing's happening. And then at that instant, we stiffen the matrix. And the fibroblasts start to change their appearance. And eventually, they start to spread out and crawl across the surface. And so the morphology, the migratory capacity, the cytoskeleton, the uh, motility of the cells is really very dependent on the stiffness. And at this instant, we soften the matrix back to the original condition. And the cells quickly revert their shape. They lose their adhesions to the matrix. They round back up and undergo this reversible process. So this is a really remarkable demonstration of how plastic fibroblasts are and how responsive they are to the mechanical environment and how uh, always culturing these cells on tissue culture plastic, I think, has unfortunately biased our idea of what the normal fibroblast phenotype is, recognizing that the normal lung is much softer. Uh, and so it's not just that these are normal fibroblasts that can do this. We've demonstrated also that patient-derived IPF fibroblasts possess this innate capability, that they're abnormally activated on a stiff matrix, but they can be reverted back to a much less activated state just by culturing them back onto a more compliant matrix. So to summarize uh, a decade of work in my lab and in several other labs, we've really kind of laid out this concept that fibroblasts exist in a couple different states that are very tied to the mechanical environment in which they reside. So if you actually take cultured fibroblasts, whether they're from um, patient-derived samples or normal lung fibroblasts, on a soft matrix, they exert very little force, 
they actually are degrading as much matrix as they are making, so they have a very non-matrix synthetic state. They're actually very quiescent, they're not progressing through the cell cycle, and they're actually prone to undergoing apoptosis if you deprive them of nutrients. In, in contrast, if you put them onto a, a stiff matrix, they exert high forces, they organize their cytoskeleton to contract a matrix, they produce much more extracellular matrix, they're much more proliferative, and they're much more resistant to undergoing apoptosis. And so we think this is an important uh, driver of the aberrant phenotype of the fibroblasts in the fibrotic lung. And our focus really has been on this red box in the middle. What is it about, how are the cells sensing this change in the mechanical environment? And could we target those mechanical activation pathways to try to return the cell back to a more quiescent state as a means of, of improving treatments for the disease? So you're not supposed to be able to read this slide. It's meant to uh, basically illustrate the overwhelming complexity of how cells interact with the matrix. So if you can imagine, this is a cell uh, laying on top of a matrix, which is on the bottom of the slide. And these are all, sort of the cell membrane is, has uh, some black proteins in it. Those would be the integrins and cell surface receptors. And then they integrate with the cytoskeleton through all of these different signaling pathways and these different proteins. And this is just an overwhelming complexity. And so thinking about how to interpret how the cells in, uh, ascertain their ex extracellular matrix, there's really two ways that we think are gonna be the most tractable for thinking about this. The first, I'm not really gonna talk about a lot today, obviously, is how do the cells bind to the extracellular matrix? So they, in, they use integrins to recognize different epitopes in the extracellular matrix. I think there's a lot of interest in targeting integrins as a potential therapeutic approach. And I think that's a really exciting area. What we've been more interested in is thinking about how information from the matrix and these different signaling pathways gets funneled into a change in genet uh, the, the program of uh, the transcriptome inside the fibroblast. And so how does all this information get integrated into a change in the state of the fibroblast? So I'm gonna basically cover two different uh, transcriptional effectors that I think are the ones that we have the best evidence for. So the first one is uh, MKL1 or MRTF, myocardin-related transcription factor. So unfortunately, this, um, this map is inverted from what I just showed you on the previous slide. So here's the cell membrane up here and here's the nucleus down here. And what you can see is that uh, integrins bind into the extracellular matrix and a variety of other sort of canonical receptor-based signaling pathways can integrate through rho, rho kinase signaling, causing actin polymerization, which causes MRTF to translocate from the cytoplasm into the nucleus of cells. And so an important point about this is that these mechanically activated pathways are not just mechanically activated pathways, they're also responsive to a wide variety of other sim signals. So there are no sort of standalone mechanosensors. Nature is, is much more efficient and it uses pathways that might respond to biochemical signals to also respond to mechanical signals. So uh, Victor Thanikal's group and Yang Zhao's group at University of Alabama, Birmingham showed that MRTF is largely diffusely staining in cells on a soft matrix, but if you just move them onto a stiff matrix, it accumulates a very bright signal in the nucleus of those cells. And alpha SMA, the canonical marker of a myofibroblast, also is upregulated on a stiff matrix, but not on a soft matrix. And they showed that if cells were deficient in this transcriptional regulator, this MRTF, that they were not able to upregulate alpha muscle in response to a change in mechanical environment. They went on in a, in a future paper uh, in the JCI published about four years ago to show that animals that were deficient in MKL1 were profoundly protected from developing fibrosis after giving them bleomycin. So they didn't develop alpha SMA uh, positive cells and they didn't develop a really robust fibrotic response. And I think it was the first example of a mechanically activated pathway that could be targeted uh, both genetically and pharmacologically to interrupt the process of scarring. So around the same time, we were wondering about how to interpret our results with lung fibroblasts on soft and stiff matrices. And we stumbled across this uh, group that was working on this area in mesenchymal stem cells uh, and as well as in endothelial cells, and they were showing um, another group of uh, transcription factors um, called YAP and TAS that also translocate from the cytoplasm on a soft matrix to the nucleus on a stiff matrix. And we went ahead and looked in uh, fibroblast cell lines and in normal and IPF-derived uh, patient sample fibroblasts, and you could see that it was strongly nuclear on a stiff matrix and largely diffuse and scattered around the cell on a soft matrix, suggesting it really switches its location based on how stiff the extracellular matrix was. That's quantification for it over here. So we looked in pathological tissue and we found evidence for increased staining and nuclear localization, especially of TAS uh, 
in uh, IPF lung tissue sections compared to healthy sections. So it seemed like there was a signal present in pathological tissue that corresponded with this. Uh, to test whether this was important to the function of the cells, we used an siRNA approach. We knocked down both YAP and TAS and fibroblasts. Uh, and I think every phenotype that we see on a stiff matrix, whether it be increased matrix production, so pro-collagen positive cells, it's uh, matrix contraction or how much force they can generate as they try and remodel a matrix, how fast they proliferate and accumulate as a function of matrix stiffness. All of those functional phenotypes were largely attenuated by knocking down YAP and TAS. And so getting rid of them seemed to have a very uh, prominent effect on silencing these activated state of the fibroblasts. And nicely for us, it had very little effect if the cells were sitting on a soft matrix, suggesting that getting rid of these things would have very little effect on cells that were in a very compliant, non-activated state. As an additional bonus, it turns out that YAP and TAS are also integrated with a TGF beta signaling pathway that we think is very important in fibrosis as well. And so a bunch of genes that are uh, implicated in fibrosis, their expression is reduced below baseline if you knock down YAP and TAS, and their response to TGF beta is largely blunted if you knock them down. And so this also has the side benefit of, again, interrupting both a mechanical signaling pathway and having a beneficial effect on a biochemical signaling pathway. So how this works, I haven't really told you, but basically it's a, it's a schematic that looks quite similar to the MRTF signaling pathway that I showed you before. You have the extracellular matrix or a bunch of other uh, receptor, canonical receptor signaling pathways that get integrated through a kinase uh, cascade. In this case, the kinase cascade actually would phosphorylate YAP and TAS and sequester it in the cytoplasm in the absence of some of those signals or in the presence of other signals, YAP and TAS translocate to the nucleus where they interact with DNA through these TED binding factors. But they also can interact with the SMADs that are downstream of TGF beta signaling. And so we think that's probably part of the reason why you get some interruption of the TGF beta signaling pathway as well. So again, I think this is an example where interrupting this signaling pathway could have beneficial effects both in terms of these uh, receptor signaling pathways as well as the mechanical signal that's activating these cells. So uh, there's no evidence in nature of uh, activating mutations in YAP and TAS in fibrosis, but we made an artificial construct where we made mutations to YAP and TAS and introduced those to cells. And so on a soft matrix where YAP and TAS would normally be diffusely uh, 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 staining the cells, you could now get it to accumulate inside the nucleus of those cells. And importantly, that activates them even on a soft matrix to increase their gene expression and increase their proliferation. So it really overcomes this limit that the soft matrix uh, has on making the cells quiescent. And importantly, if you introduce these cells into a mouse model, like the one that Erica talked about, if you inject these cells into the lung, they already have some capacity to take up residence in the lung. But if you turn on the transgene, these mutant YAP and TAS, you basically had to sacrifice the animals because their lungs were becoming so full of activated cells that were laying down extracellular matrix that we saw within a couple weeks a tremendous increase in hydroxyproline in the lungs. It's a gain of function, basically proof of concept that really aberrantly activating this pathway can lead to tremendous uh, remodeling of the lung and matrix deposition. So we were not alone in having this idea about YAP and TAS being important. So these are just examples of papers that have come out in the last two years in liver fibrosis, in kidney fibrosis, and in uh, dermal fibroblast activation and dermal fibrosis. So a bunch of groups basically came to this realization around the same time that these were probably going to be important in fibrosis. And it, I think it continues to get us really excited about over the last couple of years thinking about how this pathway could be a new uh, potential target in fibrosis. As a cautionary note, uh, the first thing that we tried was to knock down YAP and TAS in vivo. And so we tried to deliver uh, uh, siRNA against YAP and TAS. We used the bleomycin model. We injured the animals. We waited two weeks thinking we're going to be targeting the fibrotic phase of remodeling. We gave siRNA at this time point. We waited a week, and then we sacrificed the animals and looked at their lungs. And uh, completely against our prediction, the lungs actually were more injured, had more collagen, were, had more protein in their BAL fluid and were heavier. And so we basically were doing, uh, a, a, we were basically further damaging or uh, preventing restoration and, and healing of these animals. And so it's really just pointing out that YAP and TAS are not just expressed in fibroblasts, they're expressed in other cells in the lung and they're probably very important for epithelial maintenance and or wound healing. And so giving a global targeting strategy for YAP and TAS in the lung is probably a terrible idea. Uh, nevertheless, we were so enthusiastic that we decided to think about how we could get around this problem because I think there's still a, lo a lot of utility here. And we're pursuing a similar approach to this, but a group just this year published a paper using a genetic strategy uh, 
where they deleted Yap and Taz in a subset of myofibroblasts and were able to attenuate fibrosis in a kidney model. So we're trying the same approach to knock out Yap and Taz and collagen producing cells in the lung to show whether or not that can protect from fibrosis. That won't help patients because we can't genetically engineer humans to, to target the fibroblasts. And so we've really been thinking how could we use uh, uh, some clever strategies to target Yap and Taz just in the fibroblasts and the lung. And so if I take you back to this schematic, not just the mechanical environment, but these other receptor signaling pathways can modulate activation of YAP and TAS. And there was an interesting paper uh, now almost five years ago um, uh, in Cell that showed that G-protein coupled receptors have actually differential effects on the activation state of YAP and TAS. And so this is a little bit complicated, but I'll just kind of walk you through. Basically, GPCRs are one of, the most, one of the most abundant protein classes in the world and one of the most common targets of drugs. So there's a lot of great pharmacological tools for them. They're expressed in different cell types, different uh, subsets of them. And they come in four flavors, named by the kind of G protein uh, subunits that they use. And interestingly, three of these subunits seem to have at least modest uh, uh, potentiating effects on increasing Yap and Taz nuclear localization. So they could all be providing a profibrotic stimulus. But one class, when you stimulate it, actually leads to downregulation of Yap and Taz, nuclear localization, and silencing of this signal. And so we really thought, maybe we can identify a receptor that's expressed exclusively on lung fibroblasts that we could target with a ligand to inactivate Yap and Taz in those cells. So this is our attempt to do that. So this is um, using a G protein coupled receptor PCR array where we sampled the expression of 384 different um, GPCRs on alveolar epithelial cells versus lung fibroblasts. Uh, most of the cells, most of both of these cell types express both of the same kind of receptors, so they're, most of them are aligned along this line of unity. Um, probably the most famous uh, G alpha S coupled receptor in lung fibrosis is the EP2 receptor, so that's expressed at high levels in fibroblasts, but it's also expressed at high levels in epithelial cells and wasn't useful to us. Fortunately, there was one outlier. This red dot down here uh, is basically a G alpha S coupled receptor that's denoted by red that's expressed pretty highly in fibroblasts and was completely absent from lung epithelial cells. It's also absent from lung endothelial cells and from circulating leukocytes. And so it's really a potentially fibroblast preferential target for a G alpha S ligand. And so we're in the process now of trying to work out the biology of whether this is a tractable target. I'll just show you one example of how we're doing this with a, an in vivo uh, test of this. So uh, we're using a, a, a public domain compound, but I've been asked not to reveal what its name is because we haven't published what the receptor is yet or any of the story yet. But basically this compound is a known selective agonist of this G-alpha-S coupled receptor that we preferentially see expressed in lung fibroblasts. And so we gave animals, mice, Leomycin at day zero, waited 10 days, and then we gave them this compound intranasal to try and deliver it pr predominantly into the lung of those animals. And you can see that basically every metric that we've measured, including histology, hydroxyproline, gene expression, immunofluorescence, demonstrates a really profound uh, rescue of the, uh, or attenuation of the fibrotic response in the animals as proof of concept that actually stimulating a G protein coupled receptor on fibroblasts has a beneficial effect in fibrosis. And it makes us think about whether there are endogenous ligands that are normally present that would normally be stimulating this fibroblast in the setting of wound healing and resolution of fibrosis and whether some of those signals uh, might be lost in the context of pulmonary fibrosis. So this is my summary slide. I, I don't want to overlook and overstate the case that I don't think matrix stiffness is the explanation of the initiation of disease. I think it plays a large part in the progression of the disease, but I think it does so in collaboration with a lot of the other cell types that we've heard about and that we will continue to hear about in the future talks today. So I'm doing a grave injustice to all of these other cell types and all of these other functions. I just sort of lump them together. But I think basically under normal physiological conditions, fibroblasts exist in a fairly quiescent state in the lung. And I think uh, Tushar Desai's talk yesterday really talked about their role as a niche cell, that maybe they're actually providing signals that help uh, provide support to the stem cells and the, the local progenitor cells in the lung. And I think that in the case of injury, you need to be able to activate this pathway, but you want to do so transiently. And somehow we get trapped in this pathway where there's a profibrotic feedback loop where the matrix becomes stiff and that gets better and better at activating these cells and, and perpetuates this signal. And I think the question we have is, if you can uh, target this, is this actually interfering with the restoration of some of these functions? Are these aberrantly activated fibroblasts actually prolonging and, uh, a, 
preventing restoration of normal physiology. And by targeting this pathway, can you reverse or at least release some of the inhibitory effects they might be having on restoring homeostasis back to the system? So I'll finish there. I just want to thank the, the group in my lab that's done all this work. I think you saw Andrew Hawk's name. He's really been leading these studies in the laboratory. Uh, I want to thank Bob Varelis at Boston University who was instrumental in this. He's a real expert in Yap and Taz and has really helped us a lot. And Erica already mentioned our dear departed friend Andy Tager who was really influential in supporting this work and helping me with this work and, and, and will be an author on these papers when we, when we finally get them published. So thank you very much. <laughs>